Namaste and welcome to yet another session of Arohana. Uh, today we have a very exciting speaker, uh, Pushka Singh, who is the founder and CEO of Let's Transport, uh, to talk about a very pertinent topic in today's time uh, about supply chain and what approaches supply chain strategy should take and uh, other startups should take think about when it comes to procurement, transport, storage, et cetera, in a very exciting session on supply chain strategies. Um, Pushkar is also an alumnus of IIT Parapu, and uh, this is his first startup. And um, I would uh, now invite him before he starts on a presentation, to talk a little bit about his background and then delve into the presentation about let's transport and what is shaping the transportation and the supply chain environment in the country today in the context of B2C brands, uh, e-commerce, mobile commerce, and uh, particularly relevant for nice enterprises who are in the so craft-led brands or India heritage brands. Um, welcome once again, Pushka. Good afternoon. And Good afternoon. Happy, yeah. Happy. yeah. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Um, it's, it's a brilliant initiative which you've taken up and uh, would want to share, you know, whatever limited experiences that I gathered from my mistakes so that people can you know, just capitalize on that. Um, a quick introduction. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, graduated from a college called IIT Kolhapur in the year 2013. Went on to work for a large consumer goods company called ITC Limited. And I was a part of their team, which was helping them launch food products into the markets. Uh, spent some time uh, looking at supply chain for ITC, and that's essentially where I encountered the problems which larger enterprises in India faced with. Uh, what started out as a management training project, uh, I gathered about three broad insights during my deep dive, uh, solved for ITC, and then you know um, uh, got convinced and had built that conviction to start a company on its own. Uh, that's how Let's Transport was started in the year 2015, 2016. Um, what we do is we enable larger enterprises with their uh, deliveries to say distributors, retailers, or even end consumers like you and I. Uh, how we do it? We are aggregators of mini trucks. These are small trucks that you see plying on the road, uh, largely owned and operated by the driver themselves. And that's essentially where we create a value of both reliability and cost benefits for both stakeholders of our equation. Uh, been at it for about five and a half, six years now. Um, we are we today uh, about 200 large corporates trust us. These are leading companies ranging from Coca-Cola, Amazon, Pidlights of the world. And there are about 1.4 lakh truckers which are empowered through our uh, platform. Um, of this, there are about 30 to 40,000 active on a monthly basis, uh, which means that they allow us to help our brands with their deliveries. And in the process, earn about 30 to 40% more in their earnings than what they were doing earlier. So that's who we are. Um, any questions so far, more than happy to you know take it up right now and then or we could just jump into the presentation as well. Uh, Vidya, you're not audible. I think you're on mute. Yes, no, yeah. I said like we'll jump into the presentation. Okay. Uh, towards the end, we have about 15 minutes for QA. Perfect. We'll put up for QA then. Yeah. Please Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for spending about an hour with us. Um, these are some of our learnings which I have gathered, and that's something which I'm trying to present over here. Uh, what we envisage is to be the largest platform for goods distribution. Uh, it's tech secondary and tertiary transportation. These are technical terms, but it essentially translates to some of the use cases which I've mentioned before. Secondary refers to the act of moving products between warehouses slash distributors, and tertiary is essentially the last mile logistics, which is uh, delivering it to the hands of a particular consumer. Um, we are a marketplace which connects mini trucks to large corporates. Uh, today, that entire market is about $35 billion. And there are about 50 lakh small and medium truckers who are trying to you know, help us uh, reach our products on time into each other's hands. Now, uh, because this is more focused to supply chain, allow me to jump a few slides and um, uh, show the entire lay of the landscape through our lens of how we operate in this industry. Now, the challenge for most brands in India is right. your cost of logistics and inventory does not go hand in hand, which means either you have a lot of inventory at hand, which uh, uh, you know at time erodes your bottom line, or you pay for obnoxious high cost structures to get those goods delivered on time. This was one of the biggest problems which I faced in ITC as well. Right? Now, uh, you'd be surprised that while you might walk into a retail outlet, ask for a bag of Ashurvad data, uh, the retailer would say, you know, Ashurvad isn't available. Would you be okay with a Pillsbury bag? Most of us would be agnostic to that, but such phenomena is known as sales loss owing to stockout situation. And you'll be surprised to learn that 15 to 25% of our sales are lost because of that. 
Now that's just that's just not true for ITC, but any of the leading D2C brands, any of the leading uh, e-commerce platforms, so on and so forth. Now, how do you solve this problem is essentially where the entire story begins uh, from a point of factory, right? That's essentially where you're manufacturing products. And traditionally, these large factories or warehouses where you import products are located in strategic locations in India, right? It could be because of raw material proximity. It could be because of tax benefit that various provinces offer. But traditionally, you have factories located in a part of country, and then you service the entire country because consumers like you and I are scattered from Bombay, Bangalore, Gwalior, uh, Guwahati, so on and so forth. Now, the entire flow of goods, <coughs> sorry about that. The entire flow of goods, the way it happens is um, you use large trucks, which carry north of 40,000 kgs uh, between, say, a Haridwar, where your production happens, and to your destination city, think of it as Bangalore. Now, these are large trucks that you see plying on the road, uh, typically moving products from one hub to another hub, right? So it's it's a classic hub and spoke model, which India also follows. And this entire journey is known as intercity traffic. Now, once the goods have arrived in your destination city, it gets unloaded onto a warehouse, which is located on the outskirts of a city. Because you do not see large trucks moving in and around a city region. Right? So what happens in that particular warehouse is it gets deconstructed into smaller trucks. These are small vans, small trucks that you see plying inside a city. And it typically moves product from, say, a Dabaspet or an airport and then bring it inwards into, say, a Kormangla, HSR, so on and so forth. The latter is essentially known as secondary and tertiary logistics. How do you categorize both of them as? The former is essentially where you're utilizing larger trucks and the latter is where you're utilizing smaller trucks for smaller distances, which it covers. Now, that's the entire lay of landscape, which you can think from the logistics landscape. Right Now, interestingly, if you look at the problem which inherently India offers, right? Uh, most of our logistics, logistics, by the way, is about $300 billion industry. It grows at 10 to 15% CAGR, which means it adds about 30 to $45 billion every year. That's as large as India's e-commerce market. And that's fairly huge, right? Unfortunately, most of logistics happens through fragmented small individual driver owners. So the share of organized players, these are all traditional larger incumbents, is just less than 2% of the entire logistics which has happened. Now, because it's so fragmented, uh, along with high degree of fragmentation comes in lack of reliability and suboptimal cost structures, which is why we have often scenarios which leads to sales loss. At the same time, our last mile delivery cost is twice that of the global average, which means a Nestle in the US would pay about a dollar. It would pay about India $2 for a similar size transaction, yet would have just 85% reliability at the back. So it becomes a double-edged sword where you're trying to balance your cost structures along with your sales loss rate. Now, historically, that's a problem which I targeted and um, a very simple insight which can, kind of came up with the entire deep dive which I did was <coughs> most of your long distance transactions, right? Where you're talking about moving products between hubs, right? So from Haridwar to Bangalore is dominated by larger incumbent organized partners. So TCI, VR, these are companies which are largely listed companies typically solving for this problem sweep. The challenge is for anything which is intra-city region or last mile delivery, you do not have larger players solving for it. Right? And uh, from an ITC's context, what I did was I approached them to ask them if you would be keen in expanding your businesses over here. All of them categorically denied. Right? And the, the reason why they denied was a very simple primitive one was whenever you ply a 40,000 kg truck for a distance of 2,000 odd kilometers, your average revenue is going to be north of $1,000, which is about 75,000 rupees per transaction that you've done. Any transporter or slash logistics firm would make 10 to 15% margin on it, which yields about 8,000 rupees per transaction as a profit, which they pocketed. Unfortunately, what happens in the last mile space is this 40 tons of material gets divided into 50 smaller trucks. Each revenue now becomes $20 and your gross margin becomes $3. Now, most of them ask me a simple question. What's the most difficult aspect of running a business, right? uh, in, especially in the transportation landscape? I intuitively said that, is it managing a driver? To which all of them said a yes. And it makes inherent sense for them to manage a single driver and get about 8,000 rupees of gross margin versus managing 30 drivers to get a same amount of absolute profits into the company. And that's inherently what's prevented logistics from getting organized over the last 50 odd years. Right? Now, with this simple insight where your effort to reward ratio for a specific traditional company is not incentivized is what we started out for solving. Now, again, I'll jump a few slides, but going to this, 
Um, the reason when we start, thought of starting this company was a, a very simple hypothesis, which was as you reduce your average order value of any transaction, right? Your need for technology increases because you have to reduce your cost to serve. Just bear with, with me. Uh, now, what I've done is I've mapped three industries is to show where tech disruptions technically happen. Right? Now, a Bank of America, which is a larger bank based out of the US, would open up a bank branch in Nariman Point in Mumbai, would be extremely comfortable giving out a 300 crore loan to a large corporate like Reliance. Right? But the moment Pushkar walks into that and asks for a 5 lakh rupee loan, their cost structures would prevent from giving that kind of loan to us. For a 5 lakh rupee loan, we would typically reach out to an RBL bank, largely because an RBL bank would have disrupted the cost structures by opening a branch in the lower basement of an Andheri office. Thereby, their cost structures sustain a 5 lakh rupee loan. But interestingly, if you ask an RBL bank for a 5,000 rupee loan, the RBL bank would tell that, you know what, the cost of document collection itself is about 500 rupees for me. And on a 5,000 rupee loan, there would be no sense of RBL's economic profits to gen be generated from, which is why you see nowadays you have a ton of BNPL fintech companies coming up. What they say is, I do not even need to have a branch. I'll digitally acquire customer, digitally underwrite, digitally disburse and collect the money, thereby making my cost to serve a client just about 50 rupees. And on that 50 rupees, I can also turn around a 5,000 rupee loan, thereby disrupting the entire way of lending was happening earlier. With the same rationale, if you look at logistics as an industry, right? For donkey odd years, you had Maersk as one of the global shipping companies. By the way, most of the families out there who are, you know, fairly large industrialists would have some of the other routes into shipping. The reason was with every container that you export slash import, your revenue per container is about 0.1 million dollars or 70 lakh rupees, right? Practically all of us on this call, even if our cost were to be loaded onto that, you would still make money on it. The challenge is as you keep going down and keep knocking it off from a 70 lakh rupee of average ticket price to about 70,000, which is the traditional logistics companies, you can still make human dependent solutions. The challenge is when you go further <coughs> lower to a 700 rupee price point, you need technology because now you have entered a business of pennies. For every transaction, you're just going to get a revenue of 700 and your profits would hardly be 100 rupees, right? So to be a meaningful size, you need to have an algorithm which allows you to generate or manage north of 3 lakh transactions a day. That's only possible through technology. Right? And that's essentially how you start thinking about businesses, not just logistics, but any business where essentially is technology becoming an enabler, right? Either it reduces your cost structure or it opens up an access to market, which otherwise was extremely difficult to have. Now with that in play, what at least we did was we started aggregating these small truck owners. We gave them a smartphone application and on which there were 200 large corporates already onboarded onto it. Now, the reason why it became important was when we were going back to our driver owners during our conversations with them, technically from an ITC's lens or from you and I, it's extremely easy for us to think that the only way a trucker is delivering products is where probably a distributor or a warehouse officer is calling him up and delivering products outside. Right? I just, you know, just come over at 7 a.m. and render us these services. Interestingly, none of the driver owners believe that that's the case. And that's how it's different to think with a lens of empathy, right? A driver owner said to us was, sir, what do you think I do for an ITC, right? And we exactly said the same thing that probably our distributor calls and you would go and make those milk run deliveries. He said, no, first I figure out who your procurement manager is. I submit him a quotation or a proposal who then negotiates with me. He then hands me over to your sales and operations team who would teach me what to do. After that is essentially when I start getting calls who would instruct me on the direction, on the retailer, on the distributor, so on and so forth. I do this for 30 odd days. On the 30th day, I actually raise my invoice to your finance manager. He puts across a lot of shortages, debit note and credit notes, which I reconcile with him for the next three, four days. Mind you, I'm illiterate. And for the next 70 days, I chase him for getting my collections back. Right? I'm practically married to every stakeholder or manager of ITC. Now, if you expect me to manage 200 large corporates along the similar lines, most of my available days would be gone wasted by just sitting in your offices. Now, once you bring a technology in it, right, all of this can get digitized. You can get contracts, you can get invoices digitized on your software platform. All a trucker has to do is now start trip and software. All of a sudden, a trucker who was just dependent on ITC has an, has an access to more demand with over 200 large corporates on it. 
And not just that, you can start extending the same concept of democratizing working with an enterprise with various institutions, right? Be it financial services, be it OEMs, be it insurance companies, so on and so forth. Now, what we did realize, you spend a CAC on acquiring a truck driver and you can overlay a bunch of services and products curated for them and increase your LTV. That's how you reduce your low, you reduce the overall cost of logistics in the country. Now, now that's typically how I approach this problem. Right? And, and there are multiple ways of doing it. But what really worked in our favor, right? Five years ago, the most common way of delivery was through a distributor, a local retailer, and then it would land up at the hands of a consumer, right? Now, in the entire equation, which is the top column or row that I'm highlighted in gray, the entire bargaining power rests with a brand like an Nestle, right? And that's when and how they dictate what this relationship look, look, look like. Over the last five, seven years, now these local retailers have an opportunity of buying it from Odans of the world, from buying it from Metro Cash and Carry, Flipkart, Amazon, so on and so forth. Your primitive supply chain, erstwhile, had a lead or a lag time of about three odd days. So a retailer would place a delivery and a Nestle would ship it out after three days. The same retailer can expect a delivery in three hours flat from an Odan. What it has led to, it has led to a fear of missing out across most brands. And if they do not augment their supply chain, they are bound to get cannibalized by these guys, which is the biggest trend that we see post COVID getting accelerated. Now that's what pretty much, you know, we've learned over the last few months and years that we've talked about. But the last point that I want to touch upon, right, is essentially whenever you look at logistics, and I also understand that a lot of you come from D2C background and um, craft spaces, most of your logistics can get mapped down onto what use cases you bring to the table, right? Now, and I'll close this <coughs> presentation with it. Before Flipkart came in, right, India's largest logistics network was that of India Post. It's the state-owned entity, right? Now, it covers every pin code. Unfortunately, we still needed a delivery and express visa and income express. And it always made me curious as to why with such a behemoth network, you would need another network. Right? After spending a bunch of hours with a lot of stakeholders involved, this is what it boiled down to. Right? The reason why you have to look at logistics from a use case lens is as follows. Right? Whenever you think of India Post, the only image that pops up in your mind is that of a, of a little older postman carrying a bag of khadi jhola and carrying a bunch of 25 to 50 grams worth of letters in it. Right? That's what we resonate with India Post, right? Now, interestingly, for carrying about 50 odd letters for a small pin code, all you need is a very small khadi jhola. You can deliver it on a cycle, not just on a cycle. When you think of the hub and warehouses that I'm talking about, using a cabinet, you can actually store north of 5,000 letters, a cabinet as small as a Godrej, right? Now, interestingly, the only difference which an e-commerce brought to the table was you replace that 25 gram letter with a one kg of parcel. You no longer can fit 50 parcels in the same jhula. You no longer can use cycle as a stack. You no longer can use a cabinet because now you need 4,000 square foot warehouses and so on and so forth. Just a slight change in what use case is what you had to redesign the entire supply chain. Which is why whenever you think of designing a supply chain, have what is the entire use case that you're solving and what's the customer pain point that you want to solve. And I think with that, I would like to, you know, kind of uh, uh, give open up the stage for questions. And Vidya, if you have anything more than happy to spend some time on any of the slides, if you want me to. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Pushkar. Fantastic. I mean, um, you got an insight into how you guys think about how logistics is broken down, all of that, right? Yep. Um, I have a few questions uh, before I open up the floor uh, for, sure. from our audience. Um, some, of, some of us may sound really fundamental. One is uh, this, we're looking at a distribution from a perspective, right? right. Once it's manufactured, right? Yep. And then in a, uh, this is a typical metro or a city phenomenon, how distribution is broken yep. down. Yeah. Um, I want to uh, want you to share your thoughts in terms of, you know, we have you know, a tier two and tier one cities probably all look like this. Yep. Right? Um, what would happen on the sourcing side, on the procurement side, all right? Uh, because there is also a fair amount of operation research involved. Absolutely. If an ITC is making an art, uh, there are 100 different materials that need to come together, right? Um, and today, uh, you know, you know a, a heritage food brand, yep. you know, is making either a plant-based nutrition or um, you know an Ayurvedic product, right? A Daba kind of a company. 
So they all need to get this. They all have similar styles, right? You need to have 100 different things that need to come into one location. And then there is a demand forecast that needs to be done, right? And then there is a storage and then all of that needs to happen before the finished product comes through your network that you mentioned, right? Absolutely. Can you shed some light on sourcing aspects, asset, how an ITC things or anybody else in the food space things? Um, and then I'll follow it up with, how tier two, tier three cities looks like in the context of uh, this distributed sort of distribution and then the e-commerce come. I'll, I'll come to that. Absolutely. A very valid question, Vidya. And, uh, you know, if, if you were to remember the slide which I shared, um, sharing it back again for yeah, please, yeah. broader audience, uh, we did mention that, you know, the intra-city trucking or uh, drop is less than 300 kilometers, right? Now, the reason why it's 300 kilometers, it's essentially you deliver even a Mysore or a Hubli from Bangalore. And that's how you actually reach to these tier two cities, right? And again, uh, you know, a lot of my insights about this industry has been derived by talking to drivers, by talking to our clients, so on and so forth, and happy to share what we have learned till date, right? Now, um, a lot of our use cases, <coughs> unlike an Uber or an Ola, which is a fairly large metro or a cons urban consumption, right? A lot of logistics happens outside of these cities. Think of Tirupattur as, as a very remote tier two, tier three location, but it's the textile hub of India. Yeah. You have Trichy, which is the manufacturing hub of India. Mm. Now, these are places where you have both your sink and your source, right? So you have people sending their input material to these cities. You also have people shipping out intermediate finished goods towards, let's say, an ITC, so on and so forth. So what you do realize you're larger the moment your networks are established into these distributed geographies, you have an access to both more number of suppliers, as well as you're linking them in a far more efficient fashion, right? Now to your question of how we go about sourcing, right? Now, while ITC is a larger behemoth and hence it's able to kind of float RFQs, get, they would be hedging out their costs over the entire year, so on and so forth. But I think a lot of, <coughs> sorry, a lot of smaller cities, they have a bunch of, a lot of suppliers, right? And I think this, this fact or the fallacy was, I think, out in the open during COVID, right? During COVID, if you remember, during the first lockdown, government had or did give us the permission of moving essentials as a category, right? Now, milk happens to be an essential category, right? Now, if you look at the inputs which are going on, the suppliers that are supplying to a milk industry are also people who are supplying pouches or plastic pellets which gets converted into pouches, right? Now, because the entire supply chain is not mapped out, entire supplier network is not mapped out, what would happen during those few days of lockdown would be, people would stop trucks carrying plastic pellets without realizing that if plastic pellets do not reach on time, your milk production goes for us. So what you've just brought up is a concept of where you actually trace back your entire supplier perspective and then keep mapping these supply chains on a digitized format. Now, the way we look at sourcing, I think um, there are two ways of going about it. One is obviously, you know, you kind of drive price efficiencies, wherein you're focusing on economies of scale, where you're focusing on concentrated business volumes. But I also think post-COVID, especially post-COVID, you also need to diversify your risk or hedge your risks across, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which means your supply chain should not be dependent on just a few suppliers. That's something that even we use as a thumb rule, where yeah. we believe that any supplier relationship to a client should probably have a 50% share of all it. So that's where you derive most of your economic benefits, but you also hedge out your risk by having a couple of more suppliers. Now, the risk one need one needs to understand the risk could be geographical risks, the risks could be availability of raw materials in different contexts, the risk risk in case of artisans or um, craft would be sourcing from different cities. That 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 is a different uh, risk that you have to hedge. But typically, that's how we go about supplier sourcing. Mm. So, no, thanks so much. That's like quite illuminating, you know, in terms of diversifying a risk in terms of sourcing. I'm sure it's the same in diversification of risk but distribution also. Right? Um, you know, if you were to think about in the D2C context, uh, um, I say this because today you have the opportunity for so many upcoming brands, right? That's right. Uh, that can sort of uh, build a brand <laughs> equation uh, with the consumer, right? Through various means, e-commerce or Facebook or their own website or social commerce through any of the you know, Instagram, Facebook or uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, 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 mechanisms where you can work with content, community and commerce also together. Right? Uh, and then, you know, they are not uh, like behemoths like ITC where you have huge volumes. Therefore, there is a bargaining power. That's right. 
Uh, and some of these brands also do a lot of contract manufacturing because they, yep. not, they may not have. So can you give me a, an ideal picture as to how they, these kind of brands should think about, uh, I don't know what the volume SKS could be, but they could be 100th of what an ITC is. Absolutely. Because uh, in, you mentioned on the primary and the secondary and tertiary aspects. Uh, if I were to break it down, uh, I don't even know if they will have flow space in the primary leave alone the secondary or the tertiary, right? Uh, who are the players and what will Let's Transport do? Uh, how does, uh, you know, for lack of any examples, a ship rocket or another company where they talk about the dropship model. That's right. Uh, particularly, say, if I'm running a marketplace of collectives of so many either organic, sustainable uh, goods, right? Uh, I could be ordering from any art cluster in, uh, in India, right? So rather than, be, and I don't have the, uh, oh, I don't need to take the overheads of trying to store them. I'd rather pick it up from a Chennapanna toy from a cluster. And absolutely. Right? Yep, absolutely. So how should they think about uh, distribution and what's your sort of experience? Uh, absolutely. I think Vidya, that's a great point. And, uh, you know, a couple of things which I've learned uh, deeply from ITC's network, right? I think uh, one should understand where their strength lies, right? For instance, you brought up the point of contract manufacturing. You'll be surprised even companies like ITC do it. And, and the reason is where they they just want to double down on the fact that, you know, these are their large sales and marketing companies. What they're great at is distribution. What they're great at is, you know, sales, creating brands and not manufacturing anything of that sort, which can actually get offloaded, wherein you can put every dollar to creating or doubling down on your strength. Now, when we talk about D2C, right, a D2C could also be known for a wide variety of products available over there. Right. And hence, if that's what they're known for, all they should focus on is getting as many listings on their platform as much as they can, right? A D2C might also be known as quality for a very limited you know, set of SKUs or probably an R&D of a particular product, right? Now, you would, <coughs> as a company, need to identify what your core strengths are and try to outsource as much of non-core activity to partners who are more efficient in doing it. So, for instance, Shiprock and I, we have common investors called Bertelsmann. And what they bring to the table is absolutely right, a drop shipping model wherein they can pick up from any point in the country and get it delivered through a network of service providers into the arms of a consumer, right? If that's the case, if, if as a D2C operator, logistics slash distribution is not what you're going to double down on, it's well, you should out, actually outsource it out. Largely because the efficiencies which these networks have created is something which a company would take further, a lot of time to actually reach out, right? Uh, for instance, we have clients like deliveries of the world. That's largely because at a micro market, our strengths complement a delivery step. Right now, if a D2C brand is known for its quality products and a very limited SKU, I would say double down on the manufacturing itself, because that's what giving you strength over a lot of other brands and anything else you should just keep outsourcing. So if you've if you figured out a hack of what your strengths are, I would just say those are things that should be insourced. Everything else should actually be outsourced to people. Oh, no, fabulous. So in the, you know, not only in the same vein of thought, uh, we talk, you know, craft led enterprises have a longer shelf life. Yep. Uh, whereas perishable goods, which are food based, right? And there are so many exciting new food brands that are coming. Absolutely. Out. But look at, say, simply a plant based milk or a plant based nutrition, plant based, et cetera, right? Yep. Um, how should they think about uh, distribution? Uh, you know, because uh, the, the dynamics could be very different for them, right? Because That's right. There, uh, for a lot of these brands, urban customer and the metros are the biggest markets because of the density of customers being there, right? Say, a place like Bangalore, et cetera. Now, uh, and they're also jostling for space. Uh, you know, you know there is you know, retail space along with the Unilevers of the world, right? As well as there is a direct-to-consumer delivery. How should they think about, you know, considering... Um, they have a limited shelf life. I think um, that's a great point, Vidya. Uh, and if you ask me, right, we have a lot of uh, companies which are in essentially to perishables. And I think perishables is a game of supply chain, right? Uh, uh, remember, I was talking about the unit economics of how typically you have average order value reducing. I think the biggest strength of a large uh, FNV or fruits and vegetable company would be avoiding wastages would be, you know, kind of what's your turnaround time, what's your inventory cost. And truly, I think after working with most of these larger leading companies into the spaces, I've realized that it's a strength of supply chain, 
And if that's the case, then the entire brand should actually think of hubs, warehouses, and so on and so forth, right? Which means they need to understand what what network design would optimize for their wastages. At the same time, increase their access to the market, right? And um, if they're able to understand that the wastages is the biggest element of losses, they need to insource that strength amongst, right? They can work with partners like us, but the control of inventory should be very strong for an F and B industry. And if, if it is not perishable, right, then you can potentially, even after two days of delay, the person can actually receive the order without leading to a lot of wastages. So uh, a fruit and vegetable more than happy to spend a lot of time on fruits and vegetables. But I think the entire network design is, is on the USP that you're offering to an end consumer, right? As a fruits and vegetables platform, I can offer the lowest cost. I could be a Zepto saying, 10 minutes, delivery karunga. I could be a person who says, I'm going to offer you exotic vegetables, right? Which means you need to really build up a cold chain facility, a cold chain transportation network. Now, I would classify if I were running a fruit and vegetable company or an online company dealing with this, I would yes. classify what my strengths are and what is the capacity or capability that I need to insource. Now, a fruits and vegetables can run from a spectrum of 10 minute delivery all the way up to the most exotic imported products or export of fruit, uh, agri-tech, right? Now, you need to understand where this entire company would lie in the spectrum of services that they can offer. Yeah. No, it's a very good point. You know, um, I'll have a couple of questions before I know oh. you and I got phenomenal interest in the subject. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, you're right. I mean, in the days that everybody is promising 10-minute delivery, I really don't know whether we need 10-minute delivery or not. But, you know, you have, you know, um, we... 10 minute in an ambulance service is more important than a 10 minute absolutely. vegetable service. Right? I, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But what is happening is that um, uh, I don't know what the dynamics are. Obviously, people who are coming out and 10 minute delivery are looking at second order uh, disruption right? yep. uh, from a first order. So then there is this mom and pop piece, and then there is this pandemic piece where people want to uh, order from the comforts of the home. And, you know, it's always 24 hours or 12 hours gap. And, uh, you know, once Swiggy started Instamart, the dynamics changed, right? Because you get everything within half an hour, 40 minutes, right? I really don't know how they managed to do that, right? Because uh, there's a phenomenal amount of planning and inventory that is involved. Um, uh, I, I mean, it might be for essentials and groceries, it may make sense, uh, but I don't know if it makes sense for a craft brand or a food brand, right? Uh, because, uh, but today what has happened, of course, is that because of Amazon and other guys, people don't wait, want to wait for one week and 10 days for Absolutely. things, right? There is, a, there is an insight, right? I mean, more developed economies, their expectation of delivery versus Indians' expectation of delivery. So Japan and other countries have an expectation of delivery, which is three to four days. Indians, unfortunately, have reached to a point of one to two days. Right, which is very counterintuitive because as a as a economy we have, we weren't that matured. Right, e-commerce was a nascent thing for us, but our expectations as consumer is a lot more aggressive than a lot of developed economies. Right, and hence uh, to your point, um, I think the question about ten minute delivery is what's the price that you're willing to pay for a ten minute delivery? Right, if, even I would love if I can get something in ten minutes, but am I willing to pay a hundred, two hundred, or five hundred rupees? I think that's the bigger question that India needs to answer today. Right, yeah. having said that, I think. A 10 minute is probably, you know, where you're taking supply chain to a whole new level, which means just imagine the number of SKUs that we're talking about, right? It ranges, even in a company like ITC, you had thousands of them and yeah. doing a 10 minute across brands, it's, it's, it's a whole different beast, right? And hence that is a classic supply chain problem. And when you think of craft as a brand, I don't think um, the supply chain needs to be that forward, right? Which means a 10 minute delivery, but I would also nudge people to use the network, which delivers the fastest versus optimizing just for cost, right? What I've learned, um, you need to be vertically specific to solve a particular problem, right? The reason why we have chosen small trucks is because you need to go deeper into that particular asset class to create those efficiencies. Mm -hmm. If you try to spread yourself too thin, right? Being a D2C brand, trying to optimize for every leg of the journey, I think you're just missing out on speed of execution. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, the, your speed of delivery could be a big brand differentiator itself. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I ordered this morning. If I get it the same day, there's nothing like that. I think, I think people are, consumers are also used to paying a small fee, a premium fee, <laughs> in their delivery, right? If they can pay an Amazon, why can't they pay for absolutely a brand? Absolutely right. So uh, we got like phenomenal number of questions and interest. Sure. Pushpur, I'll just uh, open up the Q and A right now. Um, uh, 
Uh, There's a question from Raghavan uh, from Chennai. Sure, uh, I'll just keep answering them uh, with it, don't worry. Yeah. I'll read it out. Do you want to read it out to the... No, 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 no worries. I, I'll just read it out. I know you sure. got cough and you're recovering from COVID. So Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Do you collect orders from customers or uh, are you asked by manufacturers to collect products and deliver to go-downs or depots? Uh, our clientele would be large B2B groups, which means Nestle, Amazons of the world. They would book transactions and they would book trucks from us. And we would then be pointed to a particular distributor or a factory. So we would not go and acquire or collect orders for anyone. Understood. Thanks. Uh, this question from Mohit Aluwalia. We're a home furnishing brand uh, with an average order volumetric weight of 5 kgs. We use Shiprocket for a logistics booking with couriers like Delivery and Express Bees for 95% of our deliveries. What role do you think Let's Transport plays for making our logistics more efficient? So um, it's a classic problem. If, if your origination point and your delivery point happens to be in the same region, we would be far more uh, faster when compared to both of them. But if you're shipping out products from, let's say, a Trichy to a Kashmir, uh, I think ShipRocket Delivery and Express Bees are the right folks to work with. So uh, what's lacking is probably just to understand what the network looks like. But if, if you're essentially picking up from a seller and delivering it in, in and around a region, say from a Hubli, say a Bangalore delivery, we might be better. But if you're actually delivering it across the entire nation, a delivery express visa or a ship rocket would be a better network to utilize because they give you opportunities to work with air cargo uh, and a bunch of more trucks, so on and so forth. So uh, we do not do pan India deliveries as such, right? So we do not do a cross country movement. We do a regional movement. You know, that's a very good point. So, which means from if I have to put myself in the shoes of an entrepreneur or founder of an, a, a startup brand, yep. a enterprise, um, you know, because by being online, my potentially my consumer base is the entire world. And entire that's right. World, right? Um, do I need to optimize for, say, intra city deliveries and, uh, and the pan India deliveries? You should. Yeah. Because it follows to the next question. Okay. Yes. All right. So I run a D2C, a question from Mother Susan. I run a D2C company. My challenge is that logistics takes eight to 10 days to deliver. Do you suggest to have a uh, warehouse, you know, WH, warehouse oh, where... with delivery partners like delivery or any of them to scale my business? Or do you think we should start our own small warehouse in major cities? Yeah, I think exactly. Yes, that, that's what I was saying. It's, it's, it's anyways a question. I think Madhusudan, um, uh, happy to understand which company you run uh, because it's a very matured question. And, um, you know, we've been fortunate to have worked with a lot of D2C companies, Shiprocket, and we've grown in this ecosystem, right? With, with a, a lot of our mistakes that we've done. Now, uh, when you think of a company, right? And uh, different networks that exist, right? Um, on the entire spectrum of consumer brands, you have behemoths like Nestle's and then you have extremely niche companies of D2C in nature, right? Now, the difference between the two is a Nestle has already invested into distributors, retailers, warehouses, so on and so forth. What it wants to do is it wants to go deeper into it, into every region and super give a superlative delivery experience because they have those networks. The extreme end of a D2C is assuming Pushkar starts a brand tomorrow with a very limited resource. I would never think of opening warehouses or distributors or retailers across country. So what I would do is I would open up a website and then use a delivery or a ship rocket to kind of deliver more products, right? Now, what you'll have to understand is uh, the journey from the, the end of this spectrum to the first end of the spectrum, right? Which means when, when you start a D2C company, you technically do not want distributors and retailers, right? Which is a great thing because you're actually saving a lot of margin and thereby deconstructing the cost. But as you start aggressively expanding, you also start thinking of these questions which you've just posed. Now, the difference between the network of Pan India and Intra and the reason why I said, yes, Intra, you should have a different network is exactly this, right? A lot of D2C companies, I mean, given nature, would have a lot of, if you use Pareto's analysis, you'll have 80% of your volumes coming in from 20% of your cities. Right. Wherein if you double down on speed, if you double down on customer experience, that gives you a lot more depth. Technically, what I've seen a company, which probably might be a few years ahead of you, Mother Sudan, is they actually go into a hybrid model. So where they think, at least for the major geographies of areas that you cater to, they'll open up a small warehouse. So think of it as Delhi, right? Delhi, you can afford a two, three, four thousand square foot warehouse and you start delivering inside in and around that entire region. You, instead of having to wait for eight to 10 days, you can now deliver in three hours flat. So what happens is on the long tail, you use networks, which are pan India crisscross, you know, crisscrossing across the country, but for your denser orders, you would start thinking of bringing warehouses into a city and which is where you've now started morphing from one end of the spectrum, being completely digital to actually going towards Nestle, where you're thinking of physical assets in the country. So you'll have to understand one, where your vision is, what you're trying to do. Uh, uh, the reason why I say, what's your vision? You can also think of a company where 
this does not hold true, right? It does not hold true that Delhi has the maximum number of fraud ways. Probably you have figured out a product which is extremely relevant for tier three cities. You do, you should not open up a warehouse. But if you are in a brand where you know you think about eighty percent of your orders are going to come in from major pockets, it is a wise decision to think of operating warehouses as well. Mm-hmm. Fantastic! Thanks so much. It's a very detailed uh, answer for it. Um, there's a question from Amaya Vartak. You know, we talked about this for perishable yep. produce like fruits. Which needs speedy delivery and optimum transit conditions, such as good ventilation, avoid exposure to sunlight, agile handling, and none of the domestic players seem to provide a suitable solution for intercity deliveries. I don't know if you meant intercity or intracity. I think intercity. I, I think, but Amaya, if you could just clarify, it will be really. Yeah, any suggestions on players handling this or how to work with existing players? You can talk just in the from the context of, uh, you know, how do you move? Fresh fruits and uh, vegetables. Right? What happens in the market right now? So, I mean, given that a lot of you know, a lot of um, you are from D two C brands, I'm not very sure of the entire mix of populace. Uh, but uh, typically, uh, there are two networks. You know, from a macro lens, there are two logistics networks which operates. One is known as an outsourced partner, right? Which is like a delivery where you outsource everything. You pick up, you figure out your warehousing, and then you deliver it, right? The other extreme end is called as captive networks. Large behemoths like ITC, Nestle, they run a captive network, or even for that matter, Amazon runs a captive network. When I say captive network, they ensure that the entire logistics is under their supervision. And if if you're in a, unfortunately, you're in a category which is extremely sensitive, you need to think of captive networks, right? Which means you actually have to control the entire flow of goods. Which means you'll have to work with specific players of intercity operators. You'll have to work for players with us in an intercity context to ensure that the entire link moves extremely efficiently. The moment you think of an outsourcing of the special or speciality products, you will definitely have a lot of wastages because those outsourced supply chain think from a deliveries lens or think from a three PLs lens. They would want their network to be as generalistic as possible. Right? They would want to move pharmaceuticals. They would want to move automotive tires. They would want to move every Tom, Dick, and Harry. The moment you start thinking of speciality products, you will have to make a captive network. So, unfortunately, I mean, I'm not sure if you're into intra, if you're into inter exotic export import, but you would really need to work with a network design person from any of these companies and think of what your network should look like. But a completely outsourced three PL might not be the right guy for you. Hmm. Thanks, Pushkar. Um, we have a couple of questions also, um, you know, on the home decor brand, etc. Right? Yep. Uh, there's a point made by Hina Mehta about uh, delivery is not the core business. They're a pizzeria. Um, you know, they feel that uh, outsourcing delivery eats into our small business margins. Right? Um, so yeah, and then there is a point about ten minute delivery. Anyway, I think the main question is on uh, how should they think about outsourcing delivery, particularly if it's a food business, right? I know you're not into food delivery, but uh, given your uh, understanding of Absolutely. Dancing, yeah. So, <coughs> I, I understand they're talking about Dunzos and Swiggies of the world, right? If I'm, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. unfortunately, Hina, I know that that's something which hurts uh, each and every brand owners extremely, uh, I mean, it worsen off your margin. But I would honestly say, you know, if, if you're running a <coughs> food business, you really need to increase your margins, right? Now, it could be through value-added services. It could be through increasing your average order value. But technically, if you're solving for a of, of an instant delivery of a pizza, you really need to get your average order values higher. You need to think, thicken up your margins, right? The reason is uh, the network of hyper local deliveries, right? Which is essentially Swiggy Zomato, in in the steady state will always have a certain cost element built into it. Remember when I was talking about the the point is not that I would want or I would would I enjoy a ten minute delivery? I would definitely. But what would I be willing to pay for it, right? Now since you are delivering pizzas, um, and I understand it's a category which needs to be delivered in twenty to thirty minutes. Um, insourcing this is a difficult business, right? Which means you will have to be dependent <coughs> on um, companies like Zomato, Rapidos of the world to ensure that this delivery happens. Now, what you'll have to build into your business model is take that account or account for that cost and then start reworking your cost structure so that you can generate the margins that you want. I hope that answers uh, Hina's uh, question, uh, given her nature of business. Uh, there's a question from Vujwal. Um, I'm running a small home decor brand. The problem we face the most is the unreliability of handling by the delivery service providers and the damage in transit despite superior packaging. Uh, there is so much business to be taken for this industry that even for the industry leaders, customer service comes at the bottom of priorities. Climbing any damage through the insurance route is ultimately painful and mostly not a success. I think it's a more a point that Vujul is trying to make than a question, but I think yeah. it's a valid point, right? It's a very valid point. Yeah. Which well, you know. <coughs> 
I began, <coughs> sorry about that. I began my conversation with how unorganized logistics was, right? Unfortunately, the larger share of logistics in India is done through FMCG, durables. These are the categories which essentially run on, of which 2% of it gets organized. So when you look at the entire decor space, right, it unfortunately becomes a category which will get organized for sure, but it'll happen towards the fag end or the tail end of um, organizing logistics, right? Now, any think of any network, think of us, or think of delivery for that matter. Again, I'm not sure if you're into intercity deliveries, which means you're delivering from, let's say, a Bangalore to a Delhi, or you're delivering in and around delivery, uh, Bangalore, I'm not sure of that. But technically, the problem within home decor industry is, right, uh, one, uh, you you have some installations at the delivery point as well, right? Which means for every delivery that, that has your brand, technically, you need to have more skilled delivery boys over there. Now, from any network design or any logistics company's lens, uh, it is extremely difficult to give the same level of service across different cities that they're operating, which means uh, as a very small setup, I can go and recruit a, a guy who can actually install products for you very well. He can handle the product very well. But tomorrow when you ask, Push, can you do this in 400 cities? Uh, it takes time to build that kind of capability, largely because then I'm getting into your business of identifying who are the right furniture professionals, right? And that's why you would see a lot of these brands like Furlenkos of the world having captive networks of logistics, where we are a part of their network. But the end experience of delivering it in, and getting it installed usually is owned by the brand itself. And so I'm assuming for a home decor brand, any kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, relocation uh, kind of uh, guys are also doing the same stuff because they're used to handling it. And Absolutely. There's a captive talent already available, I guess. Uh, There's another interesting question from Poonam Hariharan. Um, she's the founder of uh, Organic Amrit. Um, are you geared for fresh produced fruits and vegetables to be specific? While we also have non-perishables and consumer goods, we are looking at intra-city partners. Um, yeah, Organic Amrit is a company focused on organic and eco-sustainable products. Oh yeah, absolutely. Poonam just dropped me an email, more than happy to look. We have worked with a lot of leading produce, uh, fresh produce companies. So we should probably, you know, at least be able to brainstorm of what network you're looking at. And I, I also hope we should be able to solve for it. Yeah, Poonam, you can just drop a mail to just us. Drop me an email. Can, uh, connect I'll put, put my email address on the chart. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I think then, um, yeah, thanks, Pushka, for that. Um, and I think there's another question from Amaya on, like, you know, just I think to pick your brains on long distance delivery, should we use, when should we use railways, when should we use road transport? I think, I think it's a question of uh, speed, uh, reliability, yeah, all of that. But uh, generally, are there any thumb rules that people follow? Is it just fast? Yeah. So, uh, whose question was it? Amaya. <coughs> Hi, Amaya. <coughs> you know, uh, interestingly, uh, most developed economies, right? Think China, think US, a lot of your freight gets moved through railways, right? So railway happens to be one of the cheaper formats of delivering products. A further cheaper product uh, format is essentially the inland waterways as well, right? Both of these are not very developed in India. Now, if you look at, we've also explored tying up with railways to understand how things can be done. But the problem with Indian railways is uh, your your underlying asset is controlled by a state entity, right? And in that particular context, uh, you'd be surprised to learn that freight, moving freight or goods train that you see on the tracks, they do not have a schedule to follow, which means a Rajdhani needs to arrive and goods train can, can arrive at whatever time they want to arrive, right? I mean, there's no scheduled or timetable for these goods train. What it leads to is, it al always leads to a fact that they're always given a lower priority when compared to passenger trains, which is why your delivery timelines take a hit. And hence, a lot of these deliveries, express bees actually use air and road because it gives a controlled experience. Now, if you come in, so a lot of, by the way, a lot of goods train is used for moving automotives, right? That, that's a very large sector which uses the rakes or goods train or think of them as commodities, right? Where <coughs> your inventory days are fairly high and the logistics cost that you save gives you that added advantage of actually losing out on one or two days of delivery, right? Uh, for a for a for a startup which is relatively younger, I would not advise you to explore railway too much. Let let it be developed through a larger logistics partner, and then use them to use a railway as a network. Because what will happen is, if you're not a large buyer to that organization, let's say for instance, a, a few larger three peer traditional companies also offer the entire railway services, right? But if you're not a large buyer from that organization, unfortunately, your service levels would always get hit. Yeah, it's a fairly good uh, lengthy response. Uh in terms of how some of these companies should think about logistics yep. asset. Because 
uh, for our community, I think either they become specialized brand in the home decor or in the food space, but they're not necessarily a large volume business with multiple scales, right? And that's for uh, a, the cost structures are different. The thinking in terms of logistics is very, very different. Um, I think we've come to the sort of end of the Q&A. I think it's a fairly, very exciting session with a lot of interesting questions. Um, I mean, please uh, continue to engage with uh, Pushkar. Just share his Absolutely. email, or you can just drop a note to us. We're happy to connect you to Pushkar, right? Um, so on that uh, note, uh, Pushkar, thank you once again, and good luck with uh, everything for Let's Transport in the future. Absolutely. Good luck to all of you who are attending the session. Uh, lovely talking to each one of you. Looking forward to staying connected with most of you guys. Thank you so much, Vidya, for giving this opportunity to us. Looking forward to this. Yeah. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Yeah. You too. Bye-bye.